listening, and welcome to a live taping of Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. Now, please put your hands together for tonight's host and publisher of Max List, Mac Pritchard. Everybody, a big hand for Trujillo. Let's hear it for Trujillo, led by Freddie Trujillo. Aren't they great? Well, thanks everybody for joining us for the 100th episode of Find Your Dream Job. It's so great to see so many friends of Max List here. And because it's our 100th episode for regular listeners, we want you to know we have a unique format tonight. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Maxless readers who will share their own job search success stories. Our friend Jenny Foss is here, and she's going to test our career trivia knowledge. Yeah, and I th you're going to like that. It's a, it's a game show, and it's coming up in the second half of the show. We've also got our own uh, Find Your Dream Job band. Again, let's hear it for Trujillo. I'm really thrilled about our special guest. It's Jared Meese of Tender Loving Empire. And Jared's gonna tell us how you can find your dream job or how to build your own. Plus he's gonna share the, the fascinating story of Tender Loving Empire, which celebrates its 10th anniversary this year. Let's hear it for Tender Loving Empire. But first, as always, as regular listeners will remember, let's first check in with the MaxList team. Please welcome my co-hosts, Jessica Black, Ben Forstag, and Becky Thomas. Okay, we've come a long way from the conference room down on Fifth Avenue, haven't we? We sure have. All right. This is our, our 100th episode, but uh, it's something I know we're all very proud of. Uh, yeah, how do you all feel about this? It's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Not bad. This is pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like thinking about our usual podcast recording with our headphones and our, you know, 90 degrees because we can't have the AC on in the conference room when we're recording. And now we're here. Yeah. yeah. So. Insider how do, how do tip this? for everybody. Yeah, that's, that's what really happens normally during the podcast is we're all just around a little table and talking to each other. And now you're all here watching us. So that's different. And we usually we have very copious notes that we're working off of. And, yeah. and here we're just kind of ad-libbing. Yeah. yeah. And we can always stop and start again, can't we? Yeah, for sure. You mean we can't do that here? We can't do the <laughs> clap thing. Uh-oh. Well, it, it is our 100th episode. And Ben, I think you and I are the only ones who have been here for every episode. Is that right? So actually, I've only done 99 episodes. Uh oh. Slacker. What happened there? Were you on vacation? Uh, well, you were so generous, Mac. Uh, you knew my second son was being born, so you let me take a week off. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, it's the kind of employer we are. But I, I, I want to say Ben is such a good guy. He actually offered to do a remote from the hospital waiting room, and somehow your wife wouldn't allow that. Yeah, I was going to call in, but the screaming in the background just yeah. it, it didn't work. Yeah. Probably for the best. Yeah, probably. Well, Jessica, you've been on the team since October, and you joined the show in January, didn't you? I have. It's been great. Yeah. Now, you get to run the soundboard. And, I do. And you kind of like that, don't I you? I do. Uh, just like tonight, I get to tell everybody what to do and make sure all everything is running smoothly behind the scenes. She's drunk with power, Mac. She's yeah. so good at it, And though. she can pardon anyone she wants to. <laughs> and I do so on a regular basis. Yeah. Well, uh, you do it very well. Uh, Becky, you've been on board for about three months, and we put you on the air t on the second week of your job. How, how did that feel? Yeah, you threw me right into the frying pan, or wait, right into the fire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was crazy, um, but it's been great. I feel like you guys have been really welcoming to me, and we've got such a great team. I'm just so excited. Yeah, it's been great to have you. Yeah, and every week you answer a listener question. It's a big job. How does it feel to, to take that on? Yeah. I mean, when I first started, I was like, well, I was just a job seeker. I can't answer their questions. Like, I don't know any more than them. But I think I used that sort of recent experience as being a job seeker to sort of help me relate to people 
that are looking for jobs and are looking for advice. And I think that's the biggest thing that we do on the podcast is mm -hmm. just let people know that it's okay and everybody has these struggles and you know we're all working on it together. We've, we've all been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's been good. Yeah. And I, I will say, Becky, uh, you do your homework. I see you do the preparation and research those answers. So you put a lot of thought into them. Yeah, I try, you know. Oh, good. Well, uh, you know. Becky I, has a fan club. <laughs> I know, a lot of my friends are here. Hey, guys. I do. Well, we've had a lot of fun with the podcast. Um, and, you know, we, we've had some hiccups along the way, haven't we, Ben? I don't know what you're talking yeah. about, man. Uh, listeners may, uh, regular listeners might recall an interview with Joshua Waldman, uh, which came in our, uh, maybe episode 10 or 15. How many times did we have to do that? Uh, I think five times we had to record the same interview. Yeah. Once because someone who shall not be named forgot to press record on the, it, uh, it, someone who shall not be named. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, Joshua was a, a real prince about it, and I think uh, if you're starting your own show, and I know there are a number of podcasters in the audience, uh, I think you, we've all had that experience once or twice. And uh, Yeah, maybe, pro tip, turn the recorder on. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, good. Well, um, you know, I'm, well, well, go ahead, actually, Jessica. Well, actually, Mac, I have a question. Um, as for you and, um, sure. and Ben here, as the veteran podcasters on the team since you've been doing it for about mm -hmm. two years now what has changed what have you seen that's changed since the first since day one episode I guess? one yeah i'll go first okay so definitely the talent has gotten better on the show um you mean me and becky yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so anyone uh, anyone who's listened to like the first few episodes like you can tell that we were pretty nervous and you, you hear it in our voice, it's quivering, we talk too much. And uh, I think that went on for like the first uh, 99 episodes or so. Yeah. But we're, like, we're really hitting our yeah, stride then our in stride the 100, in right? 100. But uh, as we've gone on, I think uh, we've gotten more confident. We, we know what we're doing now, which is awesome. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think the, the quality of the shows has just gotten better. Always good content, now better delivery. Uh, and, nice. And for me, I, a lot of people say, oh, the show's so great, it, you do it so well. And, I remember I talked about doing this show for almost half a year, and then we finally scheduled our first guest, and I'd gotten a list of equipment I needed to buy, microphones and the soundboard you use, Jessica. And I had this list for about a month, and I, our first interview was on a Monday, and on Sunday afternoon, I finally drove out to Guitar City to buy the equipment, and I put it in my car, and I was thinking, what in the world am I doing? But here the, we are. The guy at Guitar City was thinking that, too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. You know, when you first interviewed me, Mac, um, in our very first meeting, you said, oh, yeah, I want to do a podcast. And I kind of like in, to myself rolled my eyes like, yeah, everyone wants to do a podcast. That's never going to happen. And then uh, my first day of working, you started talking about the podcast again. I was like, oh, man, we're really doing this. <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it was really tough at first and it's gotten easier and better as it's gone along. Yeah. Well, Becky, Jessica, what are your favorite moments or maybe your favorite guests in the show? Uh, I would say, I don't know about a specific moment, but sometimes when we, so we have like a guest expert for every episode, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the team talks about the topic before the guest comes on. And so we're like chatting about sort of best practices as we see them. And then the expert comes on and they're like saying the exact same thing that we said. And I was just like, oh, okay, like we do know what's going on. Like we know, yeah. we do know what we're, gonna, we're yeah. doing. And it's just like a cool, gratifying feeling. Yeah, it is really nice. Uh, I guess I will say um, I really like the kind of similar, but uh, I like the conversations that we all have as a group in those intros um, because we do a lot of banter, kind of like what we're doing now, but we do a lot more talking over each other, and especially Becky and I talk. Well, yeah, we, we relate. We relate. Yeah, we relate. <laughs> we relate, and then Becky and I talk over Ben, and that's oh, always I know. fun. It's so and sad. can't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> But it's always really fun to just have um, the four of us in a room and, um, you know, getting to, getting to have that rapport. My favorite part is definitely listening to my own voice in post-production. Yeah. Um, Narcissist. Yeah. yeah anyone people who's pay done to that. have that experience, yeah. don't they? It's so pleasurable. Anyone who, who's ever had to listen to themselves knows that that's no fun. Um, I'd say probably my favorite part of the podcast is the stuff that never actually makes the show. So some of the outtakes. So We're still trying to put together an outtake reel, but bloopers, uh, don't, yeah. don't hold your breath well, for that. 
over the last two years, I've learned some things about Mac Pritchard that he probably doesn't want the wider world to know, including the infamous bus trip from Chicago to Des Moines. Yeah, his, well, that, that's in the cutout uh, <laughs> vault. We'll leave it there for now. And anyone who buys a drink for me after this will hear the story. Okay. Oh, collusion. Well, terrific. Uh, And in yeah. other news, I'm looking for a job, so. Yeah. You're, You're in, in the, the right, right place. <laughs> All right, well, the four of us co host the show, and we're on the air, but uh, there's another member of the Max List team who keeps the bills paid and, and keeps the lights on, and that's our finance manager, Annika Winters. Please join me in welcoming Annika to the stage. <laughs> Well, Annika, you know, this is the first time you've been on the show. I, I also yeah. have to ask, have you ever listened to it? Yeah, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, so I, do, I do listen when there's a topic of interest, um, like how to start over in a new city. I've had to do that before. Or how millennials look for work. I've learned a lot from millennials. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's good to know that you're adding to our, our downloads. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All 100 of them. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other favorite episodes or, or moments of, that you've heard on the show you'd like to share? Um, not specifically. I just like yeah. the camaraderie, and this is my debut. I wish I were a part of it a little more. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll maybe on. we'll bring you on as an added feature sometimes. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah. Well, we might have to work on a, a special guest expert uh, feature and bring you yeah, on. Yeah, you could be a finance expert. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I do know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, terrific. Well, I, I want to thank all, all of you because uh, I, I appreciate the talent, the commitment uh, that you bring to the show and, and just your enthusiasm. So, uh, and also your service to the MaxList community. So everybody, please join thank me in, you, Mac. in yeah. thanking the MaxList team. All right. So we're gonna, next up, we've got another segment for you and we're going to try something we've done for a long time on our blog. And it's completely new to the podcast. Uh, one of the most rewarding parts of our work at MaxList, and all of us on the team uh, have this privilege, is getting to hear job success stories from search to the hire and beyond. These are the people who come up and tell us they, they found a job, and, and we played uh, some small part in it. Obviously, they got, they got the job, but it's uh, just wonderful to, to uh, be part of that process. So I'm, I'm confident you'll find these stories inspirational and meaningful too. So let's hear our first story. She's a business development professional and she has vast experience with startups, logistics, and the green building sector. She currently does business development for Fleet Logistics. It's an online marketplace that connects shippers with freight forwarding companies and other service providers here in Portland. Everybody, please welcome Anna Walsh. Anna, come on up. Hey, Anna. Thanks Good for to see having you. me. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure. Uh, now, before we g g dive into your story, can you tell us what you did before you landed this job? You... Yeah, absolutely. I actually recognize a few people in the audience tonight. Um, I used to run the uh, accelerator at Oregon State University, so I was big into startups, a um, right. bit of a startup consultant and talking to a lot of startups in Portland, Oregon. And before that, I worked in Shanghai in clean tech and green building uh, design in in startups as well. Okay, and I, I know before you, you've been at Le, uh, Fleet Logistics, I think since January. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, and and that came after about a year of job searching. Yeah, it did. Um, I started looking for a job because I was a startup kind of consultant and dealing with startups every day, but I missed working in startups, so I started looking again to get involved in startups. Um, kind of at an operational level. And so I started looking, and it took me a full nine months conservatively yeah. to get a job in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, and was there something that you did that you think helped make that happen? Well, I looked at Max List every day. <laughs> right. That's what I did. Okay. That wasn't a plan. <laughs> In all seriousness, I did look at MaxList. Um, it's just a great resource. I also used a lot of job search websites like AngelList and or AngelList and 
LinkedIn and other other kind of networking events around the city to get to get noticed and to meet new people. Yeah. And now you've been at Fleet Logistics for some time, and one of the things I know that attracted you was that startup culture, and you've talked about how uh, you enjoy that. Uh, but you've learned new things, too, uh, in your time there. What makes this position a good fit for you, and, and, and why do you enjoy it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Does anybody here work in startups or in a startup? I'm, yeah, I'm there's a few some hands. hands. Up. Okay, yeah. that's good. Um, as you know, startups are kind of a busy place, especially depending on the size. And currently, mm -hmm. Fleet Logistics is about 10 people. Uh, we're expanding. We're going to double our team in the next six months. So that's really exciting through mm -hmm. a new venture round. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, a big deal. It's really exciting. It's, it's a good fit for me personally with this job because um, I'm, I'm a multitasker and I am used to wearing a lot of hats at, at any given position. But in a startup and as an operations manager or part of a marketplace, building part of a marketplace in our, our current company, um, you have to you have to do everything. I was just telling I was just telling my sister that today I cut checks and yesterday I answered phone calls and the okay. day before and the day before that I'm sure I did something very different. So wearing a lot of hats and being being in charge of a lot of things you never thought you were going to be in charge of is a big part of startup culture and especially in my current position. Oh, I, I can tell you enjoyed. You really uh, light up when you talk about it. Thanks, Mac. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Anna. And uh, now we're going to turn to our next guest. Uh, what does it take to find a job you love? Is it hard work, digging in deep to examine what you truly want? Our next guest spent three years in Thailand before he called Portland home. He's a content writer at the digital agency Web4. Everyone, please give a big Portland welcome to Harris Newman. Harris, come on up. Welcome to the stage, Harris. Thank you. Yeah. Now, you wrote a blog post for us, as, as did Anna and our next guest, about your, your job search success story. And you mentioned in that post that your goal in life was um, to meet the world's most interesting people and share their stories. So tell us about that, Harris. Sure. Um, that was kind of like the first thing I knew what I wanted out of life, <laughs> or at least like when I was looking for work. Sure. Um, and it's because I, I would have conversations with people, and whenever there was one that kind of struck me in a certain way, or mm -hmm. kind of stimulated me in a way where I like would see the world a little differently after that conversation than uh -huh. before, um, it would just give me like a really euphoric feeling. So I said, I want to do as much of that in my life as possible. I want to meet those people. I want to be surrounded by them, and then I want to share their story with the world. Oh, that, that's terrific. And I imagine at Web4, you you get to do that, and um, how's that helping to accomplish your goal, the, the work you have now? Web4 has been great for me. Um, it was my first writing role also, so I've definitely um, refined the craft there. But I mean, a core part of my role there is to meet with our clients and discover what makes them compelling mm -hmm. and what makes them interesting. And that's kind of what I want my life goal to be also. So it's also a skill I didn't know that I wanted to pursue didn't know I enjoyed doing, um, mm -hmm. and that was really cool for that to be revealed to me. Uh, and it's nice to practice it, because uh, that's going to get me to where I, I really want to be. That's terrific. Well, you know, in your blog post, you mentioned that you, you struggled with your job search, and many of us do. I, I've been through a couple long ones myself. And in part, you said you struggled because um, you were reaching too broadly. I, how did you get clear about your goals, Harris? I was reaching really broadly because um, I didn't have much professional experience when I started my job search mm -hmm. outside of teaching in Thailand, which is not as marketable as I thought it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was just like really stuck in my own head. And everyone that I would talk to would be like, just pick something. Mm -hmm. And that was hard because I didn't want to be wrong. Right. Um, and I was like, I don't want to waste time pursuing something that I don't want to do. So anyway, I, I did. I picked something. I said, I want to do storytelling. I didn't even know what that really meant. And someone said, oh, you should do branding. And then I talked to a branding person. They said, oh, you should do marketing. And I said, oh, marketing sounds cool. And then um, that's how I found this work. But I realized, it, yeah, it's not about being right or wrong. When you pick something, it's about being in motion. Right. And that's what brings uh, activity and yeah. momentum. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's very smart. A lot of people, and I, I certainly had this experience early in my career, we get paralyzed because there's so many choices and 
you just horribly. Yeah. Well, before this, uh, at, at Web4, you worked in the service industry. What's it been like to change sectors? Um, it took a while, like you said. And it's, it's not easy because it's like you're starting from scratch. And I'd ask people, you know, how do you break into mm -hmm. this industry? And I'm sure with changing industries is um, different for everyone. But there's always steps. There's always a process to it. And it might seem really daunting. Um, and that's how it felt for me. And a friend of mine said, make a plan and execute it. And just kind of like chunk it out. And also, um, once, that, once I had that plan, I was like really impatient. Because I was like, no, I want it to happen. Like I want, <laughs> I know what I need to do. Um, and that, wouldn't, that wasn't the best thing for me. Like I really needed to sort of relax into it. And that's what I would tell people. Um, okay. Enjoy it. Terrific. Well, that's great advice. Uh, thank you, Harris. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, let's move on to our next story. And uh, patience and persistence, these are key virtues uh, for anyone's job search. And our next guest attributes both to uh, landing her dream job. She's a community organizer, journalist, and social media enthusiast. And she's energized by activism, adventures, and events. So please join me in welcoming Oregon native and longtime friend of Max List, Lisa Kislinberry Anderson. Lisa, come on up. Well, Lisa, Hi, Max. So hey. nice to see you. Good Thanks to see for you. having me. Yeah, I appreciate you coming. And you and I, you actually came to our very first Max List event. I don't know if you remember that. I do remember in, that. that. Lucky was, Lab, right? Yeah, it was yeah. Lucky Lab on Hawthorne. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, you had those great red Converse uh, high tops. That's right, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, and you, two years later, you got a job and you shared that story on, on the Max List blog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what's it feel like to be part of the Max List community, Lisa? Um, I've always found this community to just be so energizing and authentic, and I've really appreciated it from when I was first finding my way in Portland and, um, you know, d trying to find my first steps and, and gaining career development up until now. It's just been chock full of inspiration and ideas and lots of interesting people. Yeah. And like me, uh, I think you're, you enjoy actually going to networking events, don't you? I do, absolutely. <laughs> um, most recently, we were both at the World Domination Summit, which was always a yeah, wonderful event WDS here in Portland. Lots of inspiration. Um, I always find, in terms of my career development, that's the most lovely, enjoyable part, getting out into the community and networking. Yeah. Now, when you shared your story two years ago, Lisa, you had just started a position at World Pulse. And it's a, a terrific lo local nonprofit. It increases the global voice and leadership of women around the world. And at the time, you were the volunteer coordinator. Yes. Yeah. And now, uh, I understand recently, World Pulse had to let several people go, in, including yourself. And I, I'm sorry to hear that, because uh, I've, I've been laid off myself twice, and I, it's never easy. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so I, I know when you shared your story, one of the things that you attributed your success to in landing a job there was uh, working as a volunteer is a volunteer editorial mentor. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. So at the time I was volunteering at World Pulse, I was working as a community newspaper reporter, which was a wonderful part of my career. But I was starting to feel the itch to do something new. And so having this volunteer outlet and getting to know this organization on a deeper level was such a wonderful um, way to become more involved and, and to also showcase my communication mm -hmm. skills and um, professional skill set. So it was a great inroads into um, getting my getting my role there eventually. Well, well thanks for sharing that. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the connections you made at World Pulse and elsewhere in the community are going to help you find your next position very quickly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do you have any tips for people who about how to stay resilient in a job search, Lisa? Uh, because a lot of us go through that process, and it, it takes time so often. Sure. I think one thing I've really found is to focus on being in community with fellow job seekers as opposed to feeling competitive. I think that's been huge. And I, I think that when you are kind and approachable and supportive to others, that's going to come back to you. 
I also think it's so important to carve out time to have fun and be creative, however that looks for you, whether it is getting outdoors, doing something artsy, or making a delicious meal. And, and lastly, I would say um, that I think it's important to create external accountability. I know for me that's really important. So I have a group I get together with on a weekly basis and we exchange resources and ideas and, and hold each other accountable, which is lovely. Those are great tips. Uh, Harris and Anna, are there job hunting tips you'd like to share from your searches with our listeners in the audience? I might have said it before. I kind of blacked out. I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Jessica's um, going to edit that out. <laughs> Sorry about she, that. She's got your back. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I wanted to reiterate um, the three, those three words uh, relax into it. Like, I don't know, you want to rush it along and it's like really mm -hmm. uncomfortable, but there's a lot happening at that time that you might not even be aware of. And that's a really, really critical and important time. So, yeah, embrace it. Like, enjoy it. Cool. Good advice. Anna, what would you add? You know, um, Portland especially, and I'm sure other communities, since Max List is listened to around the country, but Portland especially has a lot of opportunities for you to network and get to learn a skill, meet a mentor, go out and do something new. And for me, that was more important than sitting behind a computer and submitting job applications. I think I got a lot more traction mm -hmm. going out and meeting people. And, uh, and I think probably most people would agree that that's how you actually get a job. You, you volunteer, you network, you listen to good media, and then, and then you get it done. Okay. Well, those are, are great uh, tips from all three of you. And I, I want to say thank you for sharing your stories both on our blog and uh, here with our audience tonight. Everybody, please join me in thanking Lisa, Harris, and Anna. So that's the first half of our show, our 100th episode. Now we're going to hear more from Trujillo, led by Freddie Trujillo. We're going to take a brief break. And when we return, you're going to hear from our special guests, Jared Meese from Tender Loving Empire and Jenny Foss from Job Jenny. Everybody, let's uh, welcome Trujillo, led by Freddie Trujillo. Carolina, olvídate de todo. Tal vez. 
Cuéntame Carolina, no quise hacerte daño No me veas con esos ojos Perdóname Carolina, triste era de destino Aprenderás con los años to find your dream job. Now please give another big hand for your host and publisher of Max List and the Sultan of the V-neck sweater, Mac Pritchard. What do you say? Let's give it up for Trujillo, led by Freddie Trujillo. Well, Freddie, I, I want to invite you over here. Um, you and I haven't actually met until tonight, though you've contributed the, the theme song for our show. Uh, That's and I, true, I, thanks yeah. to your wife. Yeah, and <laughs> because my wife, Chris, and you have worked together on different projects over the years. Yeah, she, she saw our band Kagwama that I used to have um, years ago, and she helped us get, she works in publishing, so she got us in a... a a Spanish textbook. She did. And yeah, which is the coolest thing ever in my whole music career to get a Spanish textbook at college level even. It was like, yeah, it's a great credit. And I got to say, in our, uh, with Chris and I, she's definitely the cool one. That's how I came <laughs> to know you. So uh, you, when we were thinking about a theme song for the, for the podcast, we wanted something that was unique and local. And, and uh, Chris and I, uh, you know, both have a passion for, for that kind of music, and so we instantly thought of you. Yeah, it was because yeah. of the chicha. Yeah, no, we're big fans of chicha, and uh, that's Peruvian psychedelic music from the '60s. So. Yeah, <laughs> when Texaco came to Peru in the '60s, the, these oil engineers from California and Texas brought uh, the Ventures and other surf guitar sounds. Yeah down to Peru, and, and there was this kind of a cultural mashup, and it's yeah. a great sound. Cool organs. Yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely worth checking out. Now, music, um, is that your full-time gig? Because this is a, a podcast about jobs, so um, I, got, I gotta ask you. 
It hasn't been for a while. It was through my 20s, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, through the years. I moved to Oregon after a bad record deal and came up here, and I started going to school. Then I got sucked back into the music business in the late 90s with a guy that was in the Black Crows. Right. Another record deal gone bad, you know, so it's a tough racket. But uh, I finished college, and I ended up kind of right back where I was, working for a job named, called CD Baby, and they were kind enough to actually keep my music career kind of going. Good. You know, I still make lots of records. Well, and, congratulations. And, that, you know, that's a great trip to make. And, yeah. And, you, and I'm, I'm glad you get to play yeah. and, 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 and tour. Yeah, and I'm lucky to have CD Baby as a job, and, you know, they, especially for insurance. Yeah. I have kids. Yeah, we all I struggle with that, don't we, Freddie? I have yeah. kids, you know, and they're, it's yeah, been great. Congratulations. You know, well, I appreciate you contributing our theme song and joining us tonight. Yeah, well, and I, I know we're going to hear some more from you and the band. Cool. Uh, everybody, let's hear it for Freddie. Thank you. Freddie Trujillo and Trujillo. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, introduce tonight's featured guest. He's a father, a small business owner, and a songwriter. And he recently released his fourth studio album. It's called Life is Long. Uh, his wife and Brienne uh, founded and run the art store and record label Tender Loving Empire. Everyone, please welcome Jared Meese. Jared, come on up. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Now, Hi. Jared, music is a huge part of your life, obviously. Uh, so I got to ask, what was your first concert? Um, well, it's a band that nobody here has heard of called Morellis Forest. I was li living in a small... Oh, there's, uh, oh wait, she there, has, we've got okay, one great. fan there. Oh, great. Okay, one, wonderful. Um, I was with friends with some people who raised a bunch of money to fly this band out from Ohio to my small town called Pagosa Springs, Colorado. And um, it was in the back of a bike shop, and we borrowed a bunch of gear from friends, and we flew this band out and put them up in a hotel. You, and you flew the band out? Yeah. You were that, and okay. just to have the first concert, because we were so far from any real culture, and uh, it, I thought you, I'd died and gone to heaven. That's great. And, and was there one thing about that night you, you especially remember? I remember there being like 10 people, and we were all dancing, and I just felt like it was like the most magical experience um, that yeah. I'd ever had. That's Thank wonderful. you. Thank you for asking about yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I have to share my first concert was uh, way back in the early 1970s with Harry Chapin. Uh, so anybody remember Taxi, Cats in the Cradle? Okay, I'm seeing some hands out there. You remember Cats in the Cradle? Little boy blue and the man yeah. in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And of course, it is a song about a man who puts his career ahead of his family and regrets that choice. <laughs> So, perfect song, first concert for somebody who was going to create it's a, a sad job song. board. Yeah, it's it a is sad a sad song. song. But this is, a, this is a happy show. So, that's, <laughs> speaking of happiness, uh, you guys had a big milestone at Tender Loving Empire. It's your 10th anniversary. Isn't that, isn't that great? Let's hear it Thank for you. Tender Loving Empire. Thank you. So, I know our listeners and our audience here tonight would love to hear how you got started. And when we spoke a couple weeks ago, uh, when you agreed to come on the show, you said that you and your wife, Brienne, were working in service industry jobs here in Portland. And, but what you really wanted to do was focus on your, your music and your art. So tell us how you made that happen. Yeah, it was, it was, it was all very, um, it's all kind of hazy because it all just happened so naturally, but um, we ultimately just knew lots of really talented artists and a lot of really talented um, musicians, um, people that were, were making jewelry, people that were screen printing uh, prints, making comics, writing novels, poets. Um, we were just kind of like drunk on the spirit of creativity. And uh, we just moved from Los Angeles where there wasn't a whole lot of community for that, but we were just overwhelmed with Portland's community. Um, and um, it was like getting shot out of a cannon. And uh, we, we arrived here and just were overwhelmed by the, the, the number of people that we just thought were so talented. And, um, but weren't really doing anything with their music. They would record a record that was just beautiful, and then they would burn a CD and just hand it to a couple friends at a party and be done, and it was like, that was a travesty. It was unacceptable. Um, and so we, we 
just started doing our own silk screening. We silk screened a friend's um, the co some covers for a friend's novel, and I glued them all together, and we sold them on a website, and we called it all Tender Loving Empire, um, which I can talk about later. But there's there's a there was just this uh, very natural like, no, we're gonna do this for you. It's gonna happen, and. Um, and there was just a, a really great community there. And was there a moment, Jared, that inspired you and Brienne to, to do that? I mean, it, because it, it, you began doing the, the, the silk screening and, and helping artists, but was there one moment that really was kind of a catalyst? Um, I would say that it was, it was a series of moments that, yeah. just, that just, kind of, just kind of built on each other. Okay. But um, we, it, was, it, was, it was going out pretty much every night and seeing music or seeing art or going to, to one thing after another after another. And um, it was kind of a relentless schedule, but I, we loved every, every minute of it. Now, you mentioned when we spoke that both you and Brianne uh, come from families that uh, have business owners, your parents uh, on both sides. How, how did that inform your approach to Tender Loving Empire? Um, you know, I wish it had informed it more. Um, <laughs> I wish I'd gone, gotten an MBA <laughs> instead of an MPA. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, we, I think that the main thing it did is just taught us tenacity, that, there's, that the, you just do it and do it and do it and do it, and then eventually you have a, you have a business. Um, the whole idea of giving up was never really yeah. something that, that crossed our minds, and I realized that was because we learned that from our, our family. Um, both of our families have, have small businesses, and um, we didn't realize that until recently, and we're like, wow, we're both from small business families. Yeah. No wonder we did this. Yeah. Well, how, how did that transition go for the two of you, moving from working for other people to, to running your own shop? Um, it was, the, the transition was, was poor. Um, <laughs> we, Tell us more about that. We were working, you know, our service industry jobs uh, while we opened the first shop. Um, it was it was working, you know, from ten to six at the store, and then Brienne would go to work from from seven till two in the morning, wow. and then I would start back up. We found the schedule the other day from from the, when we opened, and it was it was like Monday, Brienne, Tuesday, Jared, Wednesday, Jared, and Brienne. Thursday, you know, it was like it was just us. Yeah, just unrelenting. Um, yeah, and it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was hard. Yeah, it was difficult, but it was also great. It was, you know, the greatest, some of the greatest times of my life. Were there moments when you two thought about throwing in the towel? Um, yeah, 2009 uh, was a bad year. Uh, the, it was a tough year for everybody, wasn't it? The, yeah, the biggest recession in my lifetime, um, and uh, all our lifetimes, maybe. Uh, uh, it was a it was a it was a tough year, and yeah. the whole the whole time we were you know we burned through two years of savings at that point. We weren't making any money. Um, mm. You know, it was a struggle. We had bands yeah. screwing us on the record label. Um, it was it was a difficult it was a, it was a difficult time. I I famously said in an interview in 2007 that I w I didn't really want to silk screen things for soccer teams and stuff, um, and I was just scrounging for the soccer team's silk screening jobs. Uh, yeah. I could not find the soccer teams fast enough. Okay, so you did get those jobs. Oh yeah, and, yeah. I got them. I silk screened 5,000 um, orange bandanas for OSU. And that, okay. that got us through a lot of two, 2009. All right. so. Well, yeah, sometimes it, you just got to do what you got to do, don't yeah, you? Yeah, it was, it, but we got through it and it was, yeah. it, was, good. it was good. Now, what are you most proud of, you and Brianne, of what you have accomplished at Tender Loving Empire? I mean, it goes back to the artists. The artists, uh, you know, we set out to make these, make artists have a, have a good life and have a better time uh, making their art and um, being able to make a living doing their art. And there's, there's artists today that I'm proud to say that they were, they were one man, op one person operations and they now have a couple of employees. They pay their rent from checks that we write them because mm -hmm. they make amazing art and we sell that amazing art. And um, that's, that's, a, that's what we set out to do and that's what we can, you know, if we keep doing that, I think, I think we'll keep being successful. But ultimately just being able to like, further uh, make this artist community, um, further the artist community. That's, the, that's been the goal, and I think we've, we've done a good job at that. Yeah, that's a great so goal. Far. Tell us about the name, Tender Loving Empire. It's unusual and, and intriguing. What's the story behind it? Um, we just like the idea of the, the oxymoron of, 
the, the, the juxtaposition of words. Most empires aren't tender and loving, and uh, there's no reason that they shouldn't be. And in my, in, in, when I am king, uh, they will all be that. <laughs> so so uh, when you fully become an emperor, yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, uh, now you uh, have several stores in the Portland metropolitan area, and you just opened one at the Portland airport. Yes. Congratulations. Thank yeah, you. it's a big milestone. Uh, so you employ 40 people, uh, and so you see a lot of job applicants. Uh, what, what makes the successful job applicants stand out, Jared? Wow. Um, in the end, every person we've hired has written a, an amazing cover letter. Yeah. They have researched who we are. They've been to our stores. Mm -hmm. um, we don't hire people who are not just as passionate about what we're doing as we are. And um, once you get in and you're working at TLE, if you are not on that level and you're not as passionate as everybody else, it just doesn't work. And you know we've learned that the hard way. Uh, you know, there's not not everybody who starts with us has stayed with us. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's, but it's, it's, it's ultimately, we look for people who are, are, um, are, are in this uh, with their whole body and soul like we are. Yeah. And when you think about uh, the job applicants you've met, what, what advice would you have for people who are looking for work, not just with your company, but in general, because you meet so many people, uh, to, to position themselves as a successful candidate for a job? I would say to, to be... To be a, a successful candidate, you really just need to have been doing the thing outside of the job that you're trying to get hired. And what I mean by that is hired for it. What I mean by that is, is, is if you want to do something, you should be doing it prior to starting at this job. And um, like uh, one of the people we, just, we hired for marketing, she's been doing marketing for her own little, um, little concert promotion company. Um, Set totally separately, not getting paid by herself, and I'd taken note of that and called her up and said, "You should do that here." And um, she wasn't even really trying to get hired with us, and but she's she's done great, and and she's now like I feel like the heart and soul of our company in a lot of ways. Um, so I think doing things mm -hmm. extracurricularly that you would like to do professionally is is uh, maybe a good way to yeah, sum it up. So look for ways to sharpen your skills outside of the workplace and, and follow the things that give, that you get excited about. Absolutely. All right. Now, so many of our listeners, I think, uh, when they hear your story, they're going to identify with you and, and your wife, Brianne, because... Um, they, they want to do work that is that taps into their creativity and their passion. So Jared, what piece of wisdom would you have for people who, who want to do that? What would you share with our listeners? Well, I would say, first off, don't be lured in by the, the, the myth of the entrepreneur. Um, not everyone should be an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, I, and, I, I agree. And, and I mean that with, I mean that, that straight face. It's, 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 um, it's it's kind of this. It's there's a lot of there's a lot of smoke and mirrors to the whole idea of being an entrepreneur. I think that the companies uh, out there are only as good as all the people that work there, and not everybody can or should be an entrepreneur. So first of all, don't get sucked in that you have to start your own business or do your own thing. Um, I would say that the the people who work at the businesses make the business, and um, and I would I would say be confident in that, um, and then I would say also just like really look inside at what you want and who you are, and really do some soul searching um, for 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 what you stand for, what type of person you want to be, and let that inform the jobs that you that you pursue, um, because. Ultimately, if you if you don't know that, then you'll kind of will just drift from place to place. But if you can really like dive deep into who you are and what you want, um, I think you you will you will ultimately apply for and then ultimately get the jobs that that, that really will be meaningful to you. Because I think that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. It's about meaningful work. It's right. about spending the precious days that we have doing something that actually matters uh, to us and actually like that we can look back on and be proud and. Um, I'm kind of rambling, but it's... it's no, a, I, I think what you're saying is what so many people want, which is work with purpose and meaning. And many of us struggle with finding it. And so I, I think your, your story shows one way of how to accomplish that. And I think the advice you're sharing is very wise and, and supports that. Yeah, and I, I, I just... I, just uh, I, want, I, I want to see people succeed, and I want to see people do the thing that they, 
that they love uh, for a living, and um, I think it's 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 possible to to have to have uh, spent your your time on this sort of earth doing meaningful work. Okay. Well, thank you, Jared. It's, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Please, everyone, thank me. Uh, congratulations again on your 10th anniversary. Thanks. And congratulations to you and Brianne on your second child. Thanks who a lot. Just three thank weeks you. ago. Thanks a lot. Everybody, another round for Jared Meese. Thank you, Jared. Well, Jared's story, it, it, it's really a, a classic job hero's journey. Uh, he and his wife, Brianne, came to Portland from Los Angeles. They took service jobs. They did creative work on nights and weekends. But what they really wanted was to make their creative life their career. And they figured out how to make it happen. So the Tender Loving Empire story reminds me of so many job seekers I meet that all of us do on the Max List team. And we, we talk to people who crave work with purpose and meaning, just as Jared was talking about. Now, some, like Jared and Brianne, start their own companies, but others look for great companies to join. Which leads us to tonight's final guest. Whether you're in between work and looking for that next gig or thinking about making the leap to a new career, you're going to love her proven job hunting tips. A career strategist, recruiter, and the voice of the popular career blog job, Jenny.com, a big Portland welcome, please, for Jenny Foss. Jenny. Jenny, pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mac. It's always good to be a part of really anything that you do. So I was so glad when you called to invite me. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to continue the concert theme. So I, I, sh <laughs> oh, great. I talked about Harry Karaoke, Chapin. Karaoke, everybody. And, uh, and Jared shared uh, how he airlifted a band all the way from Ohio to his bike shop. What was your first concert? Um, okay, this is going to date me a little bit. I'm going to give you the one my parents dragged me to, and then the one I voluntarily went to. Number one, dragged Captain and Tennille at the, Mich oh. at the Michigan State Fair. Can we get you to sing a lyric or two? No, no you cannot. No, okay. <laughs> And Pat Benatar was the first exciting oh, very cool. in my teens concert that I considered the real concert. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we all have that first concert somewhere in our background. You know. And it was like three miles from my house. I was like, this can't even count. But yeah, my parents get a kick out of it, so that yeah. was good. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've been on, on several episodes of our show, Jenny, both as a guest expert, but also as a co-host. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I've worn both hats. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure you guys have being the co-host. <laughs> yeah. What have you enjoyed most about uh, your time on the show? You know, virtually everything, first of all, Mac. But I think the thing that really grabs me about um, what you're doing with the podcast and, and certainly the time that I've spent with you is um, you just do such a great job of making it... Um, uh, approachable mm -hmm. and genuine and and helping with the heart about yeah. what you're doing. I, I do know that for so many people, this is such a, a stressful and confusing, overwhelming um, endeavor. Um, and I just have really enjoyed the vibe that, that comes along with your podcast. And it, it's really made me proud to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a... We're proud to have you on the show, and uh, and my co-hosts are a big part of that vibe too. So I'm I'm grateful for their. You guys are the vibe. Yeah. Now, you know, you and I talked uh, a couple weeks ago before uh, ab about this interview, and and you said nobody likes to go through a job search, and I certainly can remember that uh, when I had that experience looking for work, and I, I imagine many of our listeners can identify with that too. So, Jenny, when you help people, what, what are some of your goals in helping job seekers? I think a big goal is um, to make the virtually unenjoyable, at the very least survivable, but our hope is to make it um, enjoyable. Um, so many people just absolutely abhor uh, job search for a lot of good reasons. Um, so we really work hard to to make this something that's not as distasteful as as many people think it's going to be. Um, but another big goal we have is is to help people get untangled and kind of pointed in the right direction because 
a lot of times when you're all tangled up in a big ball, it's hard to figure out which threads to kind of pull out first and, and start getting that momentum that, that will ultimately help you move forward, however you define that. Yeah, a lot of people do get stuck uh, either being overwhelmed by choices or not knowing where to start. Not knowing where to start, yeah. yeah. If you look at it in a big ball, it's no wonder it's scary and confusing and largely offensive. <laughs> if you can figure out a way to just do you know, one thing at a time or a couple things at a time, that generally builds mm -hmm. the momentum that's really going to make you feel a lot better about it. Well, you run a successful career coaching business now. What, what did you do before JobJenny.com? Well, I've had an interesting career path. I started as a journalist out of college and then was um, lured into PR and marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to lie, somewhat was driven by the potential money in the, um, in the corporate world. Um, and I was really on a trajectory to, to move into a senior leadership role in marketing management. Um, and had kind of a realization that I was in absolutely the wrong place. And so uh, that's kind of an uncomfortable place to be because if you're in the wrong place and you've invested a lot of time getting there, you don't really know what to do. Um, I was very fortunate because I had a friend who owned, co-owned a market or a mm -hmm. recruiting agency. And for many months he bribed me, cajoled me, and and convinced me to join, drop everything and become a recruiter. And um, I took a $50,000 pay cut to learn an entirely different field. Um, and from there, it all evolved to what is ultimately jobjenny.com. Yeah, well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Nobody probably would have congratulated me at that moment. My parents thought I was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think we've all had that experience with our parents at it different times. It all terms. worked yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've had some challenges along the way. Um, what were some of the things you wish you'd done differently when you think back about the launch of your firm and, and, and your business? Well, an interesting thing about JobJenny.com is it was never intended to be my main vocation. I was working as a recruiter, and I was running a small recruiting agency in 2008, 2009. We all remember that time, or many of us, I'm sure, do. And the economy dropped out. And so I was getting a lot of calls and emails from people who were very panicked about being laid off, or I need, a, I need you to help me with my resume, I need a job. Um, and it was very hard because at the time I was a single mom and the only way I would make money as a recruiter was by filling the open positions that my clients had. And so even though my heart w was, was very touched by these people who needed help, it, it really didn't make a lot of business sense to, to spend a lot of time there. And so that was kind of what gave me the idea, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we created this other place where job seekers could come and go. They could get help, motivation, and oh, by the way, if they wanted to hire me to do any one-on-one -on -one work, mm -hmm. we would have an easy way to run them through. <laughs> little did I know that that, was, um, that little side job would quickly become what today is jobjenny.com, and uh, it, it is primarily what I do for a living today is, is through that business. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Congratulations to you. <laughs> so I was kind of an accidental entrepreneur in some ways. <laughs> well, let's talk about job hunting for a moment. When you and I spoke, you, you talked about the importance of marketing, and it's a crucial part of what you call your trifecta. Can you tell us more about that for job seekers? Sure, yes. My, my career background created an interesting tri trifecta that I couldn't have uh, attempted if I tried, but I have incredibly strong writing skills. I was a journalist through college in my early career, and then I shifted into marketing. So I learned the principles of marketing and engaging your audience. And then I shifted into recruiting. So I learned what hiring managers are looking for. I learned how the game of job search works, and it quite frankly is a game. It's not a great game in a lot of ways. And so when I founded Job Jenny, I realized a year or two in that, oh my gosh, the reason I'm good at what I do here is I have strong writing skills. 
I know marketing, and I mean, everything you do as a job ser uh, seeker is marketing your professional capabilities, and I know how the game of recruiting works. So it has given me an advantage, I think, that whoever knew that all my little job changes would end up being so advantageous for what I do today. So I, I am certainly grateful for that. <laughs> I couldn't have planned it if I tried. Well, great. Well, so for job seekers out there, they should, that trifecta, they should think about how the system works. They should uh, focus on their on writing and, and, and recognize the importance of marketing. Well, I think also you should, you should, if you have a divergent career path, which a lot of people do, not panic because mm. there could be a culmination of all your career capital that could be incredibly advantageous um, if you figure out where that um, intersection is. My intersection presented itself, but spending time thinking about where that might all intersect can be really beneficial, I think. Good. Well, Jenny, I, I really appreciate your insights. Thank you for sharing your story. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. Please, everybody, let's hear it for Job Jenny. <laughs> so don't go away, Jenny. We've got our final segment. Okay. And uh, we're going to wrap up tonight's live podcast after this. So to celebrate our 100th episode, and to give job seekers out there even more powerful tools they can use to find their dream jobs, we've created a new game. It's called Left Turn, Right Turn, because the road to finding your dream job is different for everyone. So to help us with this game, please welcome back to the stage Ben Forstag and, the, and Trujillo, led by Freddie, Freddie Trujillo. Here's how the game works, and this involves you all. I'm going to ask a series of questions to Ben and Jenny. Some are multiple choice, others are open-ended. And Jessica, is it true we've got some people in the audience ready with questions? We do. All right. So after Ben and Jenny answer, you all are going to shout out which turn you would rather take. Remember, uh, left turn or right turn. So Ben, are you ready? I was born ready, Mac. <laughs> okay, Jenny, how oh, about wait, you? Wait, first, can I say something, Mac? Oh, please. Jenny yeah. Foss, love will keep us together. <laughs> what's, what's my response? Oh, I will, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah, love is, oh, love is a battlefield. Love is a battlefield. <laughs> so basically, you're telling me you're the captain? <laughs> Ben, you're not old enough to know Captain and Tennille. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I am assuming you're ready because he is. Uh, he started the hijinks. Okay. I am ready. I've been here right. ready. So here's the test question. Uh, and audience, pay attention. Ben, what is the best way to stand out at a networking event? So you go to networking events because you want to meet people to get a job. So I think the best thing you can do is like go out there and hand out as many business cards as you can. And you like don't even need to talk to people or look them in the eye. Just kind of shove your business card right into their hand. Well, are you throwing them in, in the air too? Is it like confetti? You're like making it rain, man. Oh my gosh. Okay. So just make it rain with business cards. So that's left turn. Uh, Right turn, Jenny, what do you think? I think Ben needs a t-shirt gun for the uh, business cards. It'll be more efficient. No, no, no. I insist that you go in with an open mind, but you also go in with a plan of what you would love to accomplish or people that you would like to meet at the event. And then go in and ask genuine, curious questions. Um, no sense showing up if you don't think you have it in you to actually be a part of a conversation. So don't talk at people, talk with people. And um, know that this is probably as challenging for them as it is for you. So everybody can you know, rest in that uh, reality that we're all in it together. All right. No offense, Jenny, but my way seems a whole lot easier. <laughs> all right. I'm so gonna we throw got... away your business card, Ben. <laughs> all, right. all right, so we got two choices here, confetti, connect, plan ahead, and actually have a conversation. So what do you say, audience, on the count of uh, uh, three? Left turn or right turn? One, two, three. All right, sounds like right turn. 
All right, so we're gonna move on. Multiple choice question. Uh, which social media app is the most useful for career building? Is it Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, or Pokemon Go? Ben? Well, I, I know you think I'm gonna say Pokemon Go and make a joke out of this. Okay, um, no, you're a very serious fellow. I'm actually gonna say uh, Snapchat. Tell me more. Because when you send the wrong message to the wrong person, which you inevitably will, it deletes itself. Okay, I, did, I see a virtue to that, all right. Jenny, what, is it uh, one of these four me social media apps, or maybe there's another choice? I don't want to argue with you, Mac, because I do realize that you are an expert, but I'm going to go off the grid. Oh, my gosh. If I have to choose among those, I'm going to pick Twitter. If I can go off the grid, I'm going to choose LinkedIn, above, beyond, far and away. It is the number one resource for professional networking and job search that we have available today as professionals. Love it or not... It's LinkedIn. All right. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't know you could like pick something not in the choices. <laughs> she, she, it's like the I'm, secret I'm menu at Starbucks. I'm changing All my right. answer. Uh, <laughs> Tinder. Okay, strategy move. Um, I'm just waiting for the band to kick in here. Audience, your vote. Three, two, one. Left turn, right turn. Right turn. Okay, it looks like Tinder is going down in flames. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, let's move on. Another multiple choice. What is the best workplace movie of all time? Is it, all right, think carefully, Office Space, 9 to 5, all right, Horrible Bosses, or Tootsie? Tootsie. <laughs> all right, Office I think Ben. Space. He's a real go-getter with upper management written all over him. <laughs> okay, I think, I, I, all right, are we ready, audience? On the count of three. One, two, three. What do you say? <laughs> okay. Here's an open-ended question. Uh, ben, you're a development professional. You just found your dream job on MaxList. The posting says you need to send a cover letter by email. To get the hiring manager's attention, what is your awesome subject line? So for this one, I'm going to channel the inner id of every job seeker. All right. Go to the dark place. And, and I write something like, come on already, give me a friggin' job. All right. That's direct. Jenny? I, I'm going to give two answers because, let's be honest, Ben just gave two answers for the social media channel. If you have a connection somehow into that organization, I would say development officer position referred by Ben Forstag. So if you've got an in, make that clear in your subject line. Okay. If not, I would say development officer position um, XYZ with XYZ experience. So if you've got something that you know is very relevant and strong for what they're looking for, I'd put that right in the, you don't need a 25 word subject line, but be very quick and succinct about how you have the goods. Okay. Now Jenny, I got you on this one, because no way is putting my name in a subject line gonna open any <laughs> doors for you. I think you got a following out there, Ben. <laughs> So uh, we've got left turn, right turn. On the count of three, what do you all say? One, two, three. All right. Now we're gonna turn to you, the audience. Uh, Jessica, do you have a, uh, someone standing by with a question, perhaps? I do, I have several. So the first question we have comes from Tyrese. Oh, Tyrese, Tyrese. come on okay. up. Hello. Um, what should you never do at an interview? What's Ben? Never do. Like the one thing that never, would like never, completely never. torpedo the... Absolutely never. <laughs> so... <laughs> and I don't mean show up in a bikini. <laughs> so I, I, someone wow. over here is thinking the same wavelength as me. So there's a reason they tell you never wear open-toed shoes at an interview. And that's because like the one thing that would completely throw off the interview and ruin everything would be like if you clipped your toenails there. Oh. oh, God. That's quite an image, Ben. 
Okay, would you, let's would you move consider on. Someone? <laughs> I mean, to be to be fair, that is good advice. <laughs> that is good advice. Yes. I cannot top that. And now that you say that, one of the reasons I left corporate America is my cubicle mate cl- clipped her toenails in her cube. No, 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 no. Ooh. That is. You know what? I will say in an interview, especially if it's one of your earliest interviews, a big faux pas, unless you're directly asked, is to talk about salary expectations, ask about what vacation they offer, or what other kinds of perks come with the deal. You will be in a much better position to discuss and negotiate those things once you've established what you can walk through their doors and deliver. Because at the early stage of that courting, Mm -hmm. that's really what they care about. All right. Audience, uh, what do you think? Left turn or right turn? Left turn. turn. All right. You're losing control here, Jenny. You guys. <laughs> I demand a roll call vote. <laughs> I think I heard your wife shouting out uh, there. Okay. I think we've got voter fraud. <laughs> All right. I think we have another question. Uh, do we, Jessica? We do. We All have right. a couple more. So Yasmin here has a question. Yasmin? Awesome. All right. How do you network when you're an introvert? and you prefer to stay quiet in social situations? Great question. Ben? So, so you don't want to talk? No. OK. <laughs> so you know, here's what I would do. I would find a group of people that's already talking to each other. And like, don't try to get in the middle of the group. Just stand awkwardly right around them and just like make eye contact with people. <laughs> Stare them down. Burn holes in the back of their head. Wow. It will get their attention. <laughs> Okay, well, that's interesting advice. Uh, Jenny? One of the best tips that I got years ago from somebody at a networking event here in Portland, she does this at events, volunteer to work the name badge table at the event because then you meet and interact with every person at the event before the mingling starts and you know who your friendlies are. So when it comes time to do the networking, you can actually know who you feel comfortable approaching and it's a lot less stressful really for anyone, but certainly for introverts. Good, all right, audience, let's put it to you. Freddie, why don't we kick in that? Left turn or right turn? Right turn! All right. Uh, even I, I'm voting right turn on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're going in a circle. <laughs> it could be, but there are more questions to come, Lillian, so stand by. You know, any time now, I'm going to win one of these. All right. <laughs> you, you almost had it with the toenails, but, right. you know, just, just barely. All right. I think uh, Jessica's about to throw you a bone here. Well, I'm not, but um, Scott has another question. All right. Scott, take the mic. Yeah. How early should you show up for a job interview? Oh, good question. That's a good one. So my mother always told me that the early bird gets the worm. And my father-in-law always says that people who wake up really early are just naturally better people. Um, So what I would do is, like, I would get there, like, 15 to 30 minutes before the office even opens. And just be waiting for the hiring manager at the door. Now, like, bring them a cup of coffee or something, but, like, you want to make sure that they know that you're there and you're interested. Okay, that's an interesting answer, too. (laughs) Uh, No, 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 no. (laughs) So, Jessica actually weighed in on that one. Uh, Jenny, what do you think? Thank you, Jessica. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Um, Get there with plenty of time to navigate, if you're here, the Portland traffic. If you're elsewhere, the traffic where you live. If you are more than 15 minutes early, hang out in the parking lot. Check your iPhone, check your notes, relax, deep breathing, and then walk in when there are 10 to 15 minutes max. to spare and and check in for the interview. The last thing you want to do is look weirdly like you have nothing else to do with your time, but also it's disrespectful of those with whom you're interviewing's time because if they're running every which way and and only going to be ready at that moment when it's your time, it's awkward for them to know that you're sitting there waiting. All right, get there at the crack of dawn or 10 to 15 minutes ahead of time. Uh, audience, what do you think? Left turn, right turn? Right turn. 
Oh, okay. I, I, one more question, Jessica? We have one more question from the audience. Yeah, from Susan. Okay. Yeah. This one's a troublemaker. <laughs> oh, 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 really? Okay. <laughs> Friend of Max List, Susan. So, what is the best way to follow up after an interview? Ben, what are your thoughts? I'm gathering them. Okay. <laughs> it's a slow process. <laughs> um, so, you know, they say that uh, looking for work is a lot like dating. And uh, so I'm gonna pull a strategy that worked all the time for me, which is you don't call them back. You don't email them back, you ghost. Because if you play hard to get, they're gonna come after you. Okay. There's at least one person in this room who that worked for, so. <laughs> All right. Well, play hard to get. That's I one doubt strategy. It. <laughs> I was fully expecting a uh, call them a hundred times a day until they call you back. Ben. That would be crass. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say um, that process begins before you leave the interview. One of the last questions you ask is, what's your timeline? What's your decision-making timeline? What are the next steps? Because they might say, you know what, we're not going to do a thing for three weeks because Freddie's out of uh, town for, for the next couple of weeks. Or they might say, in the next two days, we're going to be interviewing two more candidates, trying to make our decision by Friday. Any which way, asking that question will give you a pulse on when it's appropriate to follow up. If they blow by that time frame that they expressed to you was their time frame, it's perfectly cool to contact them and say, hey, you know, I know you're probably still finalizing your plans. You had mentioned to me that you were going to be firming things up from Friday. Just wanted to touch base and see, is there any additional input you need from me to help with your decision making? Okay. Well, audience, it's up to you. Left turn, right turn. All right, all right. Well, we've got one oh last seven. question. Okay. Oh, for seven. <laughs> I burned you on that one. All right. <laughs> now, our, our goal at Max List is to connect creative people with meaningful and purposeful work. So, seriously, Ben, Jenny, I, I get the sense uh, from working with both of you that in your current roles, you're doing something you really love um, and you care about. So, my final question is, what is the one thing you most love about your job? Ben, would you like to go first? So it's probably uh, the Max List staff timeshare in Cabo. I, you're not supposed to tell people about that. Well, I've been told that after 10 years of work, I get two <laughs> nights and, and three days there. So I'm, I'm yeah, Tuesdays through Thursdays, yeah. right. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I think it's no secret that like looking for work sucks. It's awful, it's stressful. Um, and when you meet people who are in that situation, they're awful, often in like a pretty bad situation in their life. Um, and I'd say like the best part of my job is, uh, well, not meeting people at that point, but um, meeting with them, sharing with them whatever knowledge that I might have to share with them, um, and then meeting them again three months later, four months later, maybe it's at a networking event, maybe they shot me an email, uh, maybe we just bump into each other on the street, and uh, them find it being in a completely different place in their life, they found a job that they really like, and like they're completely different people. And, mm -hmm. um, and playing some small role in that, because the truth of the matter is, like, job seekers find their jobs. All I can do is offer a little bit of insight and maybe some strategy. Um, being part of that process, though, I find it really, really rewarding. Okay. Well, thank you, Ben. Jenny, how about you? What do you love most about your job? Ben completely stole my answer, but I'm going to go a, a little on a tangent of that because certainly knowing you've made a genuine difference for somebody who was feeling stuck or overwhelmed um, and, and seeing them push forward and, and land somewhere great is, is, I can't even describe how fulfilling that is. But I think one of the things that I love doing more than anything in my job is looking at all the, I call them the puzzle people pieces of someone's career and life and goals and helping them figure out how to put those puzzle pieces together in a way that will not only give them forward motion, um, help them tell their stories in a compelling way, but end up 
landing somewhere where maybe they didn't even think about before we started the conversation, um, but that's just the perfect culmination of, of their their strengths and their and their their passions and their and their goals. So, for me, that's a really really big part of why I keep doing what I do. It's it's yeah. an intense and busy and um, sometimes stressful. You got you got a lot of stress coming your way when you're working with job seekers. Um, but th that's what gets me out of bed every day to do what I do. Well, thank you. Well, thank you both. And audience, I, I don't know about you, but I think those answers both were about perfect. So what do you say? Just do it straight down the middle? Yeah. All right. That wraps up our game, and that uh, is left turn, right turn. Let's give our contestants and our audience members a big hand. All right. Jenny, Ben, thanks again. Let's give another round of applause for tonight's guests. Let's hear it for Anna Walsh, Harold Newman, Lisa Kislinberry Anderson, Jared Meese, Trujillo, featuring Treddy Trujillo. And your Max List team, Jessica Black, Ben Forstag, Becky Thomas, and Annika Winters. And most importantly, a huge thanks to you all, the Find Your Dream Job listeners. It's been a fantastic 100 episodes. We can't wait to share the next 100 with you. And thanks for letting us help you find your dream job. Good night, everybody. Yeah.